Well, today, the fourth Sunday of Advent, we'll be back here again in Post Falls. In the epistle for this fourth Sunday of Advent, taken from St. Paul's, first out of the Corinthians, chapter 4. Brethren, let a man. Let a man so account of us as um, of, the, of, the, of, of the ministries of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is, it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day. But neither do I judge my own self. For I am not conscious into, to myself of any uh, anything, yet am I not thereby justified that he that judgeth me is the Lord, but he that judge me is the Lord. Therefore judge not before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise from God. And then the gospel Taking that according to St. Luke chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother, the tetrarch of, it- of Eturia, and the-, and the country of Triconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of, of uh, Abilina, under the high priests Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, in the, uh, the, the, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And, it, and he came to all, the, all, the, uh, all the, in the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. And the Father, the Son, the Ghost, Amen. We know that in only a day and a half, a very brief period, midnight on the day of Christmas, our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, united in human flesh, will become visible to human eyes. That's only one half of the story. Will be visible to human eyes. It is a great day when God makes himself visible so that we can point with our finger and we can aim that there is Christ. He is in Jerusalem. He is in the tabernacle. He is in Nazareth. We can locate him. Right now, his resurrected body is in its perfect state as it always has been since the day of the resurrection with the scars and the Empyrean heaven at the very ends of the universe above us with the Blessed Virgin Mary. In a precise place, there his body is. And every time he becomes present in the tabernacle and on a host, he's in a precise location. And he can be seen. God has made himself visible to us. But there's another side of that. And it is recorded in the book of Genesis that God came down to look at the earth. It is also recorded, it is recorded also in the parables that the householder came in to look at the guests. And he found there one guest had not on his wedding garment. Before that, the householder came in to look at the guests, and the guests weren't there. And he sent his servants out to get them. Us seeing God in flesh is only one part of the story of the Incarnation. God wants to see Himself. God the Father wants to see His Son. God the Son wants to see the members of His body in the flesh. When that child was born in Bethlehem, he took on human eyes. And his human eyes will see 
every man, every woman, and every child. With his divine eyes, he sees everything, but he wants to see also with his human eyes. And that is why at the end of the world, he shall come in humanity. Jesus Christ comes in his humanity as a great king and as a man. And he will judge the living and the dead. And he wants to see all the living. He wants to see all the dead. And therefore all the bodies that have ever been formed, those formed in the womb and never made it to birth, and then those that were born, every single one shall be gathered together at the valley of Josephat. And he shall look upon us. His eyes shall see us, his human eyes, those sacred eyes. He wants to see us. Notice also what he inspires to the holy authors of sacred scripture, the human authors. He makes sure they write down names. They write down places. As if it is important. It's the Holy Ghost that writes these words. The Holy Ghost decided that it was important to point out the time and the place during the high priests of high during the reign of high priest Annas and Caiaphas, and these are wicked men. And Herod was a tetrarch of Galilee, and Pontius Pilate was a tetrarch of Judea, and so on. He triangulates and locates. He wanted to be born in a specific place in Bethlehem. He made the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Lord and St. Joseph travel to that precise location because he wanted to be born there. He wanted to appear to Juan Diego in, in Mexico at a specific place in the center of the North and South America at the heart of, of, of the, this, these two continents in Mexico. And there he appeared to Juan Diego at a precise place at precise time. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared. Christ wants to see us. It is true that when our Lord Jesus Christ was born, we see him. We now can point to him in the flesh and say, there he is. We see him, but he wants to see us. And how many souls are important? Every soul. When we look at the world around us, one thing we note with our own natural reason, we have a Latin axiom about it. It's called natura nihil facit in ane. Natura nihil facit in ane. Nature does nothing in vain. Nature does nothing useless. We discover that every single element of nature has value. Every single part of nature, it recycles. And the cow uh, 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 eats, it is the benefit to the grass. He returns nutrients to the, to, the, to the ground. The sun does its work. The air does its work. The clouds do its work. The flowers, the insects. Every single part of nature has a purpose and there is nothing done in aim. Natura nikil facit inane. Nature does nothing in vain. And God in his infinite love and infinite wisdom and infinite perfection decided that every single grain of sand would have a place. And you remember what he told Job. He told Job, Did I ask you where the sea should begin? should end and the land should begin where the land should end and the sea should begin he decided precisely the map of the world how many islands there would be on it and this is the way it is with nature and we see also in nature whenever we toy with nature whenever we try to play games with it something bad happens because God made all things for himself and he made nothing that was useless Everything has a purpose and a part to play in the divine plan. Now let's look at the supernatural God. The God of nature is the God of supernature. And God also told us in the Sermon on the Mount, the Heavenly Father watches over the lilies of the field. The Heavenly Father watches over all of the plants and all of the animals. The Psalms tell us that the deer, the hind, runs through the forest and God looks at him and he's happy and God turns away his face and the deer dies. That is the God of nature. 
He makes all things perfect. He determines their beginning. He determines their end and that all that is in the middle. But what about the God of supernature? He is the same God. Natura nikil faci in ane. Nature does nothing in vain. Supernatura nikil faci in ane. So also supernature never does anything in vain. Every single baby that is conceived and every child that is born and every man, woman, and child in the universe has a part to play in the divine plan. Every single one is important. There is none that is useless. This is one of the reasons why abortion, birth control, are such terrible sins. They are such terrible sins not just because they murder an innocent life. They are terrible sins because they take soldiers out of the battlefield. They take cogs out of the wheel. They take a part of nature that God intended to be a part of the supernatural universe. To be a priest, to be a bishop, to be a nun, to be a mother, to be a king, to be a magistrate. To be a part of the entire working and spreading of the kingdom of Christ. And, of, and, and the working of faith and charity throughout the world. To be a piece of the entire movement of the mystical body of Christ through time. Not one useless piece. No matter how weak... No matter how small, no matter how ignorant, no matter how far flung in the edges of the universe, every man, woman, and child is important. God does not create something that's not important. Every single conceived baby, every single born baby, every single one that walks the earth is important because super natura nikil facidinane. If nature does nothing in vain, neither can supernature. All the more. A fortiori, we would say in Latin. All the more. It's impossible. What God created good on the earth, he placed in the garden of paradise. And paradise garden is so much more beautiful than any other place on earth. So likewise, when he creates a supernatural grace inside of us, each of us has a part to play in the work of the spreading of the kingdom of Christ. Each of us has a part to play. And our Lord Jesus Christ comes down. The Father comes down to look at the guests. He comes to visit. The child is being born in Bethlehem in only a few hours. In less than 30 hours. And when that child is born in Bethlehem, that child is coming to check on the troops. He's coming to look at the earth. He's coming to look at the guests. He's coming to survey the battlefield. He's coming to spend his time with us. For there are two sides of salvation. On the one side, we must look to God and we must go to God. But on the other side, he comes to us. He's coming to us. Therefore, we must be ready for his visits. We have to be ready. We have to prepare ourselves for his visit. And he said, you know not the day or the hour of my visitation. He's coming to visit. And this visitation is not only his divine visitation, because God is already in his divinity everywhere right now. He doesn't need to come and visit in his divinity. He's already here. He holds his place in existence. He sustains it. But his humanity wants to come. And he will come. There will be no place in the universe that the human eyes of Jesus Christ will not look. He will look at the farthest corners of the universe. And that is one reason why Isaiah the prophet says, When Jesus Christ comes, every hill shall be made plain. Every valley shall be filled. And why is that? Because at the top of the hills you can hide. In the bottom of the valleys there's hiding places. But the rough ways will be made plain. The hills will be made, made flat. The valleys will be filled up. And it shall be perfectly smooth. And there shall be nothing hidden. For all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. And the Lord shall see all flesh in his human eyes. My delight is to be with the sons of men. He wants to be with us. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to be amongst men. And every man is important. He uses the weak to confound the strong. 
but not because they're strong, but because they are proud, and because they have find their strength somewhere else. Hence their strength shall be destroyed. But God did not intend Annas to be a wicked high priest. He did not intend Judas to betray. He did not betray one soul to go to hell. Imagine these souls have responded to the grace of God and fulfilled the purpose for which he made them. Earth would be such a beautiful place, so magnificent, so filled with charity, so filled with truth, so filled with peace, absolute perfection and happiness. And there will be a little test, such as a garden, and a tree in the middle of the garden that we should not eat of. And passing that small test, we go to eternal happiness. But God gives us some other small tests. He does not allow his will to ever be thwarted. His will is never going to be stopped. Many souls turn against him in our times and in old times. And these souls try to stop the fulfillment of the will of God. As we mentioned yesterday, right now it's the end of the nine-day journey of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. It should only take three days maximum to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But it took them nine days. And why did it take nine days? Because the devil tried to stop them from arriving. Because the devil knew the prophecy that Herod did not know and the priests did not know. They had forgotten it. They had to look it up. The devil didn't have to look it up. He knew that the child of the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. He knew that that child was in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. And he knew that Mary and Joseph were on their way to the city of Bethlehem. And he did everything in his power to stop it. He made every possible obstacle, and hence the journey took nine days and not three. He inspired in his demonic way all the souls to him, small ways and great ways, in every possible way to stop and prevent the arrival of the child in Bethlehem. He made sure there was no room in the end. He made sure the others did not, did not accept him, until eventually the child had to be born in a cave outside of the city. But the fact is that our Lord Jesus Christ wanted his human eyes when they would first open upon this world to see all of his creation represented at once. He wanted to see the rocks of the cave. He wanted to see the animals, the sheep and the goats and so on, the chickens. He wanted to see the hay and the manger and he wanted to see shepherds and he wanted to see his mother and St. Joseph. He, wasn't, he didn't need to see a human house. He didn't need to see that. He's not here because of our houses. He's not here because of our things. He's here because of our souls. He has more things than we could ever dream of. And everything that we make is a, is a rearrangement of something he made anyway. Plastic comes from the world. Computers come from sand in Silicon Valley. Every single thing that we make comes from something that is God, that God created. As Father Hunter used to point out, he says that when you look at the modern world, it is a computer world. The computer world is made out of the silicon. The silicon is made out of sand. And that in a literal sense, that our kingdom of the modern world is literally built on sand. As Christ said it was. There would be a kingdom. You build your house on sand, it's going to collapse. But who created the sand? God did. There's nothing wrong with sand. Just don't build a house on it. And the fact is that we're building our houses on sand. That's the trouble. But God came into this world to see human flesh, to judge human flesh, to be with us. His delight is to be with us. It's a two-sided coin. And every single soul matters. Hence the genealogy of the sacred scripture. The listing of the names of the kings and the places. Because they're all important. Every place is important. This place is important. Every soul is important. And God uses all as an instrument. And here's what the devil doesn't understand. Even when we turn against God, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Look at the animals. One animal tries to kill another, and in the end, both are benefited. 
The fact is that God arranges all things. And when the devil tries to attack the divine kingdom, and the devil tries to attack the divine plan, and the souls turn against God, they do not stop his work. He still does his work, and every play part has a place to play. Might even be tearing down a bridge in one of the swarms of the ants, the fire ants in South America a hundred years ago. The ants went into the sea. They went, into the, uh, uh, they went across a moat. And they went, into the, and they went on, on the moat and then they died. They died. And then other ants stepped upon their dead bodies. And they also drowned until there was a thick wall of dead ants. And it created a bridge. And they went across the bridge. And so the devil, in his attempt to destroy Christ, he's taking souls and casting them into the sea, and they're dying. He's taking souls and casting them into the sea, and so that he casts them into the sea so they won't live and be able to cross the other side. But in fact, they're just making a bridge. He will not stop the work of God. Every little move he makes has a counter move, far more powerful from God. Natura nikio fasidinane, supernatura nikio fasidinande. Supernature does nothing in aim. Every single thing is controlled by God. And He wants to see us. Every part of the, play, of the play is important. Every person is important. One of the principles of the modern world, remember that we are the father, the devil is the father of lies. And one of the principles of the modern world is called the Copernican principle. In the Copernican principle from Copernicus, a Catholic priest who, uh, who had a mistress and who was a mathematician uh, from uh, Poland and who was, who was a, we, we give name, the scientific revolution after him, Copernican revolution. And Copernicus, of course, is the one who uh, published at his death because he didn't want to be uh, excommunicated. But they did the, the book, De La Borisolis, on the, uh, the earth, the sun being the third a planet and the sun being the center of the universe and the earth just floating around. And hence comes the Copernican principle. And the Copernican principle is the earth has no significance. It's just floating through the, uh, the Milky Way in an, in an everlasting infinite space. It's just another dot. Man has no significance. We're just another evolved creature of the billions of creatures in the world. Man is just a statistic. He doesn't have a purpose. These are lies of the devil. God the Son became man in order to shed his blood to save one soul. He left the 99 sheep in order to find the one that was lost. He's looking for souls. He's looking for each individual. There are many discouraged souls in the world today who think that they are abandoned. The Lord Jesus Christ abandons no one. He's coming. He, is a, he will come again to the world as a judge. But now he comes in his humanity with his human eyes. He comes with his missionaries in the church. He comes in the blessed sacrament. He comes in the confessional. He comes with baptism. He comes with the preaching of the gospel. And he comes in human flesh, using human flesh, in order to do what? To go out to those souls that are in a state of despair. Those souls that think they are completely abandoned. In our days, there are so many abandoned souls. So many souls living alone, without brother, without sister, without mother, without father, completely abandoned, playing video games, watching movies, trying to fill up the emptiness of their lives and living in complete loneliness and heading towards a direction of complete despair. And our Lord Jesus Christ came on this earth to find them. He came on this earth to go after them, to go look for them, to go into all the places where they are and to pull them out. His eyes, his eyes are here, his human eyes. It is not only that we can go and visit him. If you don't visit, he will come. He goes into the places where they are committing sins that they might repent. He sees the drunkard and the, uh, as, and the drug addict as he's completely collapsed in his drugs and completely collapsed in drunkenness and completely collapsed in impurity and completely collapsed in despair. As I can pick you up and carry you upon my shoulder, I'm going to look for the sheep 
My delight is to be amongst the sons of men, and men are weak, and men are foolish, and every single man is important. Their weakness and their foolishness is all going to be wiped away by the power of the supernatural God. He's coming. Cannot be stopped by the lies of the modern world. He can't be stopped by modern education. He can't be stopped by modern uh, security systems. He cannot be stopped by modern lies. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And also now in a few days, in early January, well, a couple of uh, girls will be coming to Kentucky to begin our little convent, to make the beginnings. Well, the fourth attempt to get this little convent going. An active order of sisters who have to, of course, spend their time in this postulancy in the Vishit. Girls that are going to be missionaries that will go out to those houses where people are abandoned and alone. They'll go out into the streets and go to those that are abandoned and alone and bring them Christ. Bring them the answer to all the problems of the modern world. We'll go to, out to the lost sheep and the lost ones and bring them to Christ. Prepare them for confession. Prepare them for a true marriage. Prepare them for baptism. Prepare them for Christ. And give them the answer to the sorrows of the modern world. We need girls, spouses of Christ, who will carry the divine eyes, who will carry Christ, to look at the poor and, the, and those that are abandoned and bring them Christ. We need spouses of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to take his human eyes, not only his divine eyes, but his human eyes and look upon the weak and look upon those that are struggling and look upon those that have abandoned God. And he uses human flesh. Here is the trouble of man. We have two choices with our human bodies and our human passions we can loan them for the use of Christ and his holy church and his holy mother or we can loan them to the devil for his use they're not ours we can only tell, turn the steering wheel the engine runs we have the power to turn the steering wheel is it going to be turning towards heaven and be loaned to Christ? Or is it going to be turn towards hell and be loaned to the devil? God wants his humanity, the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be inside of us. And he wants to go and see the weak and those that are struggling and discouraged. And he wants to go to the farthest and weakest ones. And every single soul is important. When the devil is trying to murder so many millions of souls and making sacrifices of, to Satan called abortion, and don't forget about birth control, another form of just millions of uncounted abortions, and don't forget about the sins of marriage. How many babies are not born because of the refusals and the sins of marriage, because of the violence and hatred between the father and the mother? How many children are prevented from coming into this earth? The devil knows and he hates them all because he's terrified of these soldiers of Christ about to be born. If you can stop them from getting to the beachhead, it's just like an invasion when all the ships are coming to the shore and they're going to invade the shore. The enemy tries to sink the ships, sink the landing craft, sink them before they get to the shore, make them drown in the sea. And so many souls have drowned in the sea of marriage. Never even making it to the shore of life. These are sacrifices to Satan and they are loaning the soul to Satan. How many separated husbands and wives when they should already have many children but instead they're separated? How many abortions? How many contraception? Contracepted babies? Every single child is important in the army of Christ. It was the 25th child who saved the Holy Roman Catholic Church several hundred years ago. And she never learned how to read. And she stayed in her room all the way until she was 16 years old. And most of her brothers and sisters never even saw her most of the time. And that was Catherine of Siena. 
And she saved the church. She was an important cog in the wheel. Who is God going to raise? Every single soul. One of our foolish lies that we believe with the devil is we're waiting for a new Archbishop of Fev. We're waiting for a new David. We're waiting for a new St. Pius X. We're waiting for the Pope to do what he's supposed to do. The Pope has to consecrate Russia to the Macaulay to Mary. No. We must do the work of Christ. We have to carry Christ to souls. We have to loan him our eyes. We have to loan him our bodies and our passions. We have to carry Christ to souls and every single soul must do that. Not just one. And the householder has come down to look at all the guests. Remember what it said in the parable. He found one man who had not on his wedding garment. One man that had not on his wedding garment. Was he the most important man? Was he in the front row? Was he in the special section? Was he in the back? Was he standing against the wall? We don't know. Our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't care either. I don't care if you're the butler. I don't care if you're the one cleaning the floor. I don't care if you're the king in the front. I don't care if you're the pope, the bishop, the priest, the deacon, or a sister, or a simple mother, or a simple father, or a little baby. You better have on your wedding garments. And there was one man that didn't. Let him be cast forth into the exterior darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because the incarnation is not just about us seeing the little cute baby. It's not about us seeing Christ. He comes down to look at us. He comes down to see us. And he comes down to be with us. And he comes down in order that we might carry him to souls. That's what we have to do. And spread him as far as, as possible. Because he rules already the whole universe. It's already his. What did the wise Columbus do? He had a cross. He landed on San Salvador where he had never been before. He knew some people lived there. Some Indians. What did he do? Did he ask permission to visit? He took the cross of Christ and he planted it on the shores of this new world. That's the first act that he did in 1492. He put that cross in the ground and he said, This land I claim for Christ. That's what I'm here to do. Columbus was driven by the desire, by a driven desire that was in the heart of his blood to bring Christ to souls that did not know him. And he knew that there was a new world. He knew in his heart. It was such a long way to China, such a long way to India. There must be some land in between. And that land is people with souls that do not know Christ. That land is people with souls that need Christ. And he felt the desire to bring Christ to those souls. That's what drove Columbus. And why he was made a venerable in our holy church over a hundred years ago. And they began the process of canonization of Christopher Columbus. But American bishops a hundred years ago brought it into it. They didn't want a saint to be the founder of our country and our new world. But he came to bring Christ. And he came to plant the cross. And that's what he did. He planted the cross. And we are supposed to imitate Christopher Columbus. When you go to some new place, what do you do? Plant the cross and claim it as the land of our Lord Jesus Christ. Claim them as the souls of Christ. And if the devil has hold of them, we go and capture those souls. We bring them away from the devil. We take them out of the snares of Satan. We pull them out of sin. And no matter how despairing, how many sins, how bad, how many times they sold their soul to the devil, what the weight was, we don't care. We're going to take those souls and bring them back to Christ. We're going to take those souls and pour Christ inside of them because he wants to see them. He wants them at his, ta at his dinner table. And we are now at the time we have invited all the traditional Catholics. We've invited all the good Novus Ordo Catholics and conservatives. We've invited all the good guys to the feast. But behold, there's still room. 
Therefore we are compelled by our master to go out in the streets to find the unworthy ones, to find the bad ones, to find the ones on the extremities of the universe, to find the ones with tattoos, to find the ones discouraged, to find the ones on drugs, to find the ones that have given themselves over to the devil and drag them into the feast. And on the way in, hand them a wedding garment. Here's your wedding garment. Here's your wedding garment. It was a custom in the marriages in those days. The wedding garments, the, the owner had, the, the father had thousands of wedding garments. You didn't have to have a wedding garment. You come in as you are. And then you go to the closet and take a wedding garment and put it on. That's why there was no excuse for the man. Why didn't you have your wedding garment? It's right back there in the closet. Why didn't you pull one out like everybody else? He has no answer. We must hand out the wedding garments. We must remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is here in order to bring souls, to see souls, and carry them on his back to the Father. He's not here just to be seen. He's not here to be visited. He's going to visit. It's one of the tragedies in the society in recent years. The meaning of the word mission has changed. The priests used to say mass here in Post Falls, for instance, and there would be missions 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And he would go out of the, out, out of the, out of the church in Post Falls, one that burnt down where our church is, and he would go up into the mountains. And he'd go off into the, uh, up to the north, and he'd go up into the mountains, up to the pass. And then he would go around and bring Christ to souls and they were called missions. The mission was a place where the priest was sent. The word mission means sent. The mission was a place where the priest was sent in order to bring Christ to souls who lived in that location. Now what's happened is the mission is a place where the priest hangs out, smokes cigarettes and drinks beer and praises the Lord and then the people come and visit. The priest is a visitor of souls. He is sent. Ite misai est, we say to you, imitate the priest and go and be sent at the end of the Mass. And go and carry Christ to souls. Make sure the Christ you receive here in this church, you bring him to the workplace. You bring him down the highway. Make sure you've got a rosary hanging on your mirror. Make sure it's clear that you are a Catholic. Make sure there's a picture of the Sacred Heart in your work locker. Have a palm hanging on the top of your, in, in your car above the mirror from Palm Sunday. Make sure there's a rosary always in your pocket and a scapular always around your neck. And the word of Christ coming out of your mouth every day. Carry Christ to souls that Christ you might see others and bring them to Christ. That's what must be done. So we pray for young girls to get the grace to be able to come and give their lives to God. Be missionaries to go and bring Christ to souls and souls to Christ. We're heading into a great crisis. We need brides of Christ. We need brothers. We need priests. We need families that are going to do more than just have babies. But they're going to make their house a place for the unfortunate. We say that in the marriage blessing. May your place, may your home be a place of rest for the unfortunate. How many homes have that? When the diet comes and the old married couple goes before God. We had a 50,000 square foot house. We had everything we needed. Did you remember Lazarus? His house is 50,000. The rich man, Devez, his house is 50,000 square feet too. He had everything he needed. He went to church every single Saturday. It was the Old Testament. He was following the law of God. He never committed any sins. He's in hell. Talk to him about it. Get down there to hell right now. Because there was a poor man outside of his house that was not visited if Christ is in us, we must understand that we must carry him. We must visit. It's a long journey from heaven to earth. It's a whole lot longer than going 8,000 miles or 24,000 miles around the earth. 
It's a very long journey that Christ came, leaving from the very ends of the Empyrean heaven, billions of miles away, a real place. And he came from all the angels down to this earth to visit us. He put on human eyes and he took on human flesh to visit us. And he goes to visit all mankind. And he wants us to be seen by him. And if we try to escape, we shall not. And every single man, every single woman, and every single child, born and unborn, everyone conceived, is of the utmost importance to God. God does nothing in vain. He can't. He only does good. And we must remember this in our present battle. He only does good. Therefore, let's respond to that good. Let's prepare for his coming. And let's go to him. So he doesn't have to travel so far to come and see us. Let's bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.